So good, af good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're really actually looking forward to this chat. Uh, about 25 years ago when most of us in this room were a little younger and certainly the three of us on this stage were a little younger, we all played a, a major part in the creation of the Canadian REIT market. Around that time there were some naysayers, there were some in the industry that were a little skeptical, but I'm certainly very pleased to look back on 25 years and to have seen this industry evolve in an interesting, lively and really very successful manner. We're going to start today by taking you down a little bit of a tour down memory lane. Uh, what happened, why, what was interesting, what wasn't interesting. But then we're going to talk about the evolution of the market and in particular about the opportunities and challenges that it faces today and may face in the future. So without, uh, without pausing here, I'm going to leap right in. I'm looking at Stephen and uh, Stephen, I'm going to ask you to go down memory lane here. We all probably have different recollections of the heady, hectic days of 1993. Creed, of course, first REIT to list on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It grew out of a real estate mutual fund trust and evolved into a bright new shiny REIT listed on the TSX, closed end, monthly cash distributions, but with a set of fairly stringent investment restrictions and operating restrictions. So Stephen, recalling back to those times all those years ago, what were the key events and the key steps that led up to the creation of the REIT market in Canada and enabled Crete to launch? Well, thank you, Pat. I'm not going to pretend that I remembered all this, so <laughs> she had given me a heads up on this question, so I actually did a little research. And um, uh, looking at Crete being enlisted in September of 1993, um, I, I looked at the uh, kind of what led up to that. And what's interesting, we have one slide today between us, Ed, so a little myth that we, <laughs> we're not going to share it. But which, it which he snuck up on me. I don't know what it <laughs> is. We have one slide, which uh, I can ask them to put it up. I think I just pressed Press this. Yep. And this was the uh, period leading up to 1993 when Crete was listed. And the peak on this chart is kind of 1989. And what this is, is the TSX real estate sub-index uh, in the late uh, 80s, 80, 1988, 90. And the uh, composition of the index, the sub-index at that time was made up of great companies. Uh, companies like Trizac, uh, Cambridge, Bramley, some very, very great names in the industry. And they own some wonderful assets, assets like the uh, Yorkdale Mall here in uh, Toronto. And you can see with that peak, basically real estate was very much in favor with investors uh, in the uh, late 80s. And then over the subsequent three or four years, the index actually came off 93% over that period. It's staggering the crash, basically, of what happened. And most of these companies either filed for protection or were bought out at low prices and so on. But the, uh, in addition to the publicly listed companies, there are also, as Pat mentioned, uh, real estate mutual funds and uh, limited partnerships. Limited partnerships were popular, uh, but not a, uh, an eligible investment for RSPs. They were considered foreign property for RSPs at the time. Uh, so uh, away from public securities, what people look to is these real estate mutual fund trusts. And of course, they suffered the same uh, damage or decline in their valuations over that uh, period. And so um, the real estate mutual funds had a requirement for redemption. So they had to keep a part of their assets in cash and um, the uh, redemption was based on appraised values. And unfortunately, the appraisals are always based at a point in time based on historical information. The market was declining so quickly that the uh, valuations couldn't keep up. And so people were redeeming out of these mutual funds at values that were literally higher than the underlying assets were worth. So catastrophe. So um, Ultimately, they had to freeze redemptions in the, uh, in the mutual funds and look for a way out of the room. Uh, and so a lot of these mutual funds looked to become closed-in trusts, and closed-in trusts basically had no requirement for a redemption. However, they did have a, uh, a stipulation that uh, real estate wasn't an eligible investment. So we'll come back to that in a second. So complications. In any event, uh, Crete basically evolved from the Metfin Real Estate uh, Growth Fund, which was um, sort of salvaged by uh, John Donald and Gary Samuel and uh, uh, converted to a closed-in trust 
and listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in September of 1993 amid all this turmoil. And uh, we're going to talk about it later, I think, but the, uh, those early days were very, very difficult, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, but the, uh, and ultimately, the uh, closed-in trusts, uh, there was a change in the legislation uh, in the Income Tax Act that allowed uh, real estate to be an eligible investment for closed-in trust. And that was the beginning of the REIT industry in Canada. Thanks, Stephen. Yes, when you said ultimately, yes, I remember well dealing with the uh, folks at uh, Revenue Canada, and it was uh, quite um, it was quite the series of arguments we had to mount. Most of which focused on the fact that so many of the real estate mutual fund investors were individuals who were depending on that income. So we really had to we had to pull out all the stops to get them to make that change. Um, Eddie, you were right behind Crete in terms of converting. About, yeah, about three months later, I think we went public in January 94, uh, although we did our conversion in November. Um, yeah. And I still remember spending the summer of 93, because uh, we had to have a vote for the conversion, because uh, we were also a mutual fund. And um, I, I basically spent the time visiting with groups of unit holders who uh, wanted nothing but their money back and I wasn't in a position to give it to them because in addition to the appraisal issues, uh, in the early 90s, uh, the time period we're talking about, there was a complete lack of liquidity in the market. No matter, almost at no matter what price you wanted to sell, you couldn't sell, there was no buyers. And the banks wouldn't lend any money to buyers anyway. And uh, I mean, many of you, uh, the younger ones here, all the great companies that are owned by the pension funds now were amongst those public companies. Uh, you know, uh, Cambridge got bought by Ivanhoe eventually, mm -hmm. Cadillac Fairview by Teachers, Oxford eventually by Omers. I mean, it just goes on and on. The ones who didn't get bought just went bankrupt. And uh, <laughs> there was a time, I remember Jim Bullock at the time was the uh, CEO of Cadillac Fairview. And I ran into him walking down the street one day and he said, Eddie, how are things? And I said, what do you mean, how are things? How should they be? <laughs> it's, it's 1992, they're terrible. <laughs> I, he sa I said, but you, you know, you're CEO of Cadillac Fairview, you probably don't know about that. And what he said was, <laughs> he says, you know, Eddie, we're all on the same conveyor belt. At the end of that conveyor belt is a fire called bankruptcy. The only difference between your company and mine is our relative positioning on that conveyor belt. And uh, I mean, essentially he was right. And what you have to understand for the early REITs, and it continues to this day, is, and, I, and I'm sure uh, that Steve did the same thing I did. You looked back and said, okay, the few companies, generally private, that survived, and you know, what commonality did they have? And when you looked at all the ones that went broke uh, or had to get bought, what did they do wrong? Because real estate, you know, can be a cyclical business. Things go up, things go down for, you know, almost with interest rates in some ways. Um, and, you know, I think we all figured out perhaps different things, but I think there's a commonality in the basic declarations of trust. And why are they there? Why are we restricted to no more than 15% of our assets in development? Why are we restricted that we can't have more than, I can't recall the percentage, um, of our assets with any one revenue source, i.e. any one tenant? Biggest restriction, leverage. You know, why are we all, do we all carry some form of leverage restriction? And I think those original models have become the model, but you have to appreciate, for all REITs, you have to appreciate they were put in there to let us go out and sell to investors and say, we're not like the guys who came before. Even if we want to load up to 90% debt, which most of these public companies had, <laughs> we can't. It's against our yeah. declaration of trust. We can't go crazy with development. We can't own all kinds of unproductive land for any extended period of time. We're just not allowed to because nobody believed real estate guys. There was actually a joke at the time uh, said, you really want to get even with your kids? Leave them your real estate. I mean, it seems a little bizarre with what's happened with values the last uh, 10, 20 years. But uh, that, I think, drove a lot of the original structuring, trying to convince the world of investors that real estate could be a safe asset. And 
I really think that what ended up happening, and the way I used to look at it, is that REITs became the vehicle by which the public side of real estate investment was recapitalized because there was zero capital going in. Well, there were almost no public real estate companies left. So, uh, you know, we really, really, really recapitalized the whole industry. And I, I, again, I'll speak for Ria Ken, you know, Stephen being much more successful. But the, the, it took five years till I would say REITs got sort of respectable. You know, through 98, I mean, every offering was, was a struggle. Every offering had to be marketed. And then, you know, today you look back and say, well, you know, you just call up your friendly investment banker and say, you know, I need $200 million or I need $500 million. It wasn't that easy back then. They'd say, yeah, why should I give it to you? you know, let's go marketing. And it's just a different world today. And then it, so uh, it took a while. Your, what was your strategy in those first early years? Uh, you know what? My strategy was, was very simple other than survival. Um, it was to grow. Uh, it was an e relatively, maybe nothing's ever easy, but it seemed with the, seems with the benefit of hindsight, it was easy. Uh, there was a real spread between cap rates and what your cost of funds was going to be, uh, a positive spread. So essentially, uh, the more you could buy, the better off you were. You not only grew and, and became scalable, you could go out and raise more capital, and you could actually increase your per unit FFO all at the same time. So there was a, it was really grow by acquisition, um, you know, for the longest time, perhaps occasionally, in my case anyway, not with the greatest of discrimination. Uh, but I, I still remember our, our first sort of portfolio acquisition, and there were a lot of portfolio acquisitions. Uh, was in 1995. Um, those of you who were around that might remember there was something called a referendum about Quebec leaving <laughs> in 1995, which actually just didn't make it, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah. And uh, the case to Depot, which at the time owned Ivanhoe and had just bought a supermarket chain then called Steinberg's, um, was selling all the real estate outside of Quebec particularly in Ottawa, because they figured, hey, Quebec separates, Ottawa's going to be a disaster. And I think we bought five or six shopping centers from the case, uh, probably around 11 and a half or 12 cap, to give you an idea of what, I mean, not that cap rates were that high, but they were a very motivated seller. I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread, but then I had to raise $140 million, which was not easy in 1995, and, uh, but we, we got it done, and actually we still own several of those uh, shopping centers, one of them now being turned into apartment buildings. But it was all about buy and grow, and buy creatively, I think was the magic word. So Stephen, Crete's carved out a path for, for success for itself since 93, which of course culminated in the merger with Choice Properties REIT. Do you want to comment a little bit about one on what Crete's path to success was? Uh, yeah, I think uh, just uh, um, uh, the starting point, uh, as, as Ed mentioned, uh, it, it's interesting, the REITs actually uh, weren't put in place by design. Someone didn't have a brilliant idea and said this is going to be a great vehicle. Mm -hmm. so, so they, they, they started by default. They were there to, exactly. to, as a solution to a, a very significant problem. So in the, in the early days, it, it was survival. I mean, basically, the, uh, the early days were, were very difficult and raising money was very difficult. Um, but in terms of uh, Crete's strategy, um, uh, strategy is different for these real estate uh, entities depending whether you're a publicly traded entity, a private family, or a pension fund, and your strategies would be significantly different. As a publicly traded REIT in Canada, uh, we, we felt early on, basically, in order to be successful, as you, the, the word you use, uh, the, which I'll come back to what the definition of that might be uh, in terms of success, but the uh, in order to be successful as a publicly traded REIT, we felt we had to deliver um, three things. We had to deliver FFO growth or earnings growth on a very consistent basis. We had to deliver uh, distribution growth or dividend growth on a consistent basis and NAV growth or net asset value growth on a consistent basis. And by consistent, I don't mean quarter to quarter, but I mean over a measurable period of time, an appropriate period of time, you had to um, uh, achieve those three things for success as a publicly traded REIT. 
And so we uh, developed a culture internally with, uh, with our senior management and our people basically to focus on, on these three things from the, from the early days. And we built a strategy around that that was focused on acquisitions, uh, financial management, and property operations. And those were the three main pillars of our strategy. On acquisitions, uh, we were a little different than Ed. Uh, we, um, we focused on quality assets. We were willing to take less yield uh, and uh, were less concerned about volume. And at the end of the day, both strategies worked very, very well in terms of uh, long term. Um, but uh, our acquisition, and we were also diversified. And that caused us a little bit of grief in the early days because people wanted to focus on pure play REITs. Uh, we felt there was a better opportunity as a diversified entity. So acquisitions was one pillar of our strategy. Financial management was the second. And that really entailed uh, our level of debt, our um, access to liquidity, payout ratio, and uh, transparency in financial reporting. And that, that, was, uh, that was a significant part of our strategy. And the third leg of our strategy was around property operations. And property operations in the early days, and even to a large extent today, not totally, but to a large extent today, is asset management, property management, and leasing. So that, that was the strategy, basically. And the, once you have a strategy, it's getting the right people uh, in, in those senior roles and have them understand to this, uh, the strategy and have their behavior governed by the strategy. And so over time, we were very disciplined in our strategy in terms of trying to uh, deliver the three things I mentioned in terms of FFO growth, distribution growth, and NAV growth. And that's really, uh, in terms of our success, um, that, that's what, strategically, that's what we focused on, that business model, that strategy. In terms of defining success, um, Carolyn mentioned uh, earlier today about the, over the 25 years, the uh, composite index, TSX composite index, I think the number was over the 25 years was like 8%, the read index was 11, and Creed outperformed uh, the read index by a fairly significant mar margin over that period. Um, but really, return to unit holders is only one aspect of success. Success is also what have you done with your business? What kind of shape is your business in? Uh, what does your portfolio look like? Uh, the strength of the assets, the strength of your management team, uh, the strength of your balance sheet, and, uh, and importantly, your ability to, uh, to find and execute on appropriate uh, opportunities going forward. That's all part of success above and beyond uh, return to unit holders. So let's move, let's move the story a bit forward. Eddie, I know you've got some pretty clear views on how the REIT market and the REIT industry has changed over the last 25 years. What, uh, what have, for you, what have been the, what do you see have been the key changes and what were the factors leading up to those changes? I think the, uh, I mean, obviously it's, it's grown by an order of magnitude. I don't think uh, either of us could have uh, imagined the kind of market oh, capitalization right that's in the REIT market today. But I, it's sort of, I, I think the successful REITs had to change uh, as the real estate business changed. At the end of the day, um, even though I may joke about it, that we're really not in the real estate business, we're in the paper business, and how well our, our units perform, we are in the real estate business. And uh, it's changed dramatically. For example, in Riyakan's case, the strategy that I outlined before that was really focused on growth uh, worked great. Um, you know, our unit holders were rewarded. It was fun. It was exciting. We became very quickly the largest REIT in Canada uh, after we bought out one of the, the third guy who went public around when we <laughs> Real did. Fun. Real fun. That was a lot Real of fun. fun. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's terrible. We've all forgotten his name. Actually, I remember. I remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> but the, uh, but it won't be we mentioned. We didn't get it, so that's why I remember. <laughs> but the, uh, the fact is we found after about a decade of doing that by, you know, pretty early on in, the, in this century, uh, around 2003, 2004, uh, pricing of real estate assets had changed where it wasn't that easy to just grow by acquisition. You could still find your spots, but sort of more than 10 years after the blow up of the 1989 to 1993 that, that uh, Stevens chart showed, you know, the world had come around and say, you know, real estate's pretty good and growth is great and, you know, everybody's doing pretty well. So 
there was a lot of money starting to pile into the sector. So we changed our strategy a little bit. We were continuing to buy where it was possible and we could fit it in uh, into our portfolios uh, on an accretive basis. But we felt we had to create a uh, development arm. Uh, originally, and when we first started back around 04, 05, it was to expand, change, uh, update some of the shopping centers we owned. You know, my standard line back then was, you know, we don't have a parking lot that Tim Hortons doesn't want to put a pad in. And so a lot of it was just adding pads to existing parking lots, uh, getting a little more density on the massive amounts of property, because you have to appreciate for the kinds of shopping centers that Rhea can largely owned, I'll say owned, but still owns, um, they're built to about a 23 to 24% coverage. The rest is all parking lot and grass. So there's a lot of land, you know, a 100,000 foot shopping center uh, needs 400,000 feet of land. That's almost 10 acres for what's a pretty standard size shopping center. So we had a lot of land to, to focus on and we started focusing on that aspect of the asset in a very preliminary way. And, you know, leaving aside our, our side move into the United States in 2009, which then ended, I guess, six years later when we uh, sold it, arguably maybe six months too late, but the timing was overall pretty good. Um, we basically continued that strategy to this day. It's just evolved, you know, from adding pads, we're now either tearing down parts of shopping centers, rezoning parts of shopping centers, and building, uh, you know, multi-unit uh, residential, additional office space, uh, not forgetting about the retail. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we may get as diversified as Crete used to be. Not as diversified anymore, I think. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> so, you know, I had to take a jab somewhere. But the, um, so it, it's and you know really what I wouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I wouldn't say. <laughs> but uh, so we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, and and that's, that's sort of been a big change. Um, you know, the, the head of our acquisition group is sitting here. And, and other than, you know, the odd buyout of partners uh, in existing shopping centers over the last three, four years, I don't think we've bought anything. You know, may, maybe that site in Yorkville, exactly. but uh, but that's about it. So, you know, I don't think you could have said that for a four-month period if you went back 10 or 15 right. years ago that we didn't buy anything. It's really been asset management, property management, redevelopment, new development on, on our existing sites. That it, it really, and if you would ask me that 20 odd years ago, I said, what? <laughs> you can't do that. Now, the REIT structure is not the ideal structure for what we're trying to do today because of the very limitations that I talked about. But you know what, it makes, I sometimes say we've got a lot of balls to juggle. We've got to grow FFO, we've got to keep our leverage on side, and we're going to do three to 400 million of new development a year. Not easy, but that's why they pay me the small dollars. <laughs> Are we going to talk about that? <laughs> what are you going to if, you, if you'd like, come on. Well, I, that wasn't I'm, I'm part responsible of the... <laughs> for your increases in compensation, admit it. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So, okay, for both of you, obviously, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. But the, it's but been the, a great I, ride. And yeah. the REIT industry has had an interesting ride. There, yeah. you know, there, there were challenges along the way, and there were a few gremlins. You and I were reminiscing this morning, actually, about the good old unlimited liability. Uh, issue that popped up a few years after the REITs were born and created a lot of havoc uh, until ultimately we got legislation to, to end that issue. But speaking of challenges and gremlins, uh, Stephen, when do you think the industry finally became mainstream and accepted in the market? Um, so mainstream is a, I'm not sure. Yeah, been, uh, I'm not sure we're there yet. <laughs> it, it's not a precise point, but uh, um, I, I think the, it's to answer that it's, uh, uh, if you look at sort of breaking up the 25 years into certain periods, and uh, Carolyn this morning broke it up, uh, Carolyn Blair in her presentation broke it up into eight periods. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna make it that complicated. I think there, in my view, there was sort of three periods, kind of the early days, the formation days, and sort of midlife, and then the current. And so in, just in those three, uh, 
uh, those three areas. In the early days, which were sort of from 93 to the early 2000s, say that 10 year period, um, the first part of that was very difficult. As Ed mentioned, uh, raising money was uh, difficult. I mean, we were uh, all out looking for uh, money and uh, believe well, me. Well, the first five years, we had to actually explain to investors what's a REIT. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure yes. you went through the same thing. Yeah. Like, what is that? What are you selling, yeah. Eddie? Yeah, and if, I mean, there are some great stories around that, but it's, but it's uh, we, um, uh, those, certainly those early days were, were difficult, but we, we started to get traction and the real estate industry did recover. And uh, in the mid-90s, 96, 97, uh, it became sort of uh, attractive to investors. But the investors that were really attracted to REITs were the ones that were looking for yield. And uh, for Creed, I know, uh, we had a lot of investor meetings where, with investment advisors, and they were putting uh, their, uh, their retired uh, clients into REITs because yeah. it was a high yield. Yeah. And not only that, the REITs basically as a group agreed to pay their dividend or their distribution monthly. And for retirees to get a monthly uh, check. With and, tax advantages. Yeah, with, with the tax, tax deferral. Absolutely. With the tax deferral was huge. And so um, in the sort of 96, 97, uh, the interest in REITs driven by that uh, was, was quite good. And then, uh, unfortunately, in the late 90s, uh, real estate started to fall out of favor, uh, not because the fundamentals were bad, but uh, because of the tech bubble. And the tech bubble, uh, everybody thought they could make yeah. 30 to 50% in the, in, the, uh, in the tech securities. And, and they did for a while. And they did. A year or two. <laughs> and, then a while. While. <laughs> and so uh, during that period, and around 2000, and this is something else I actually looked up over the last day or so, the average REIT yield around the year 2000 was over 13%. So uh, yeah, a distribution right. or a dividend right. of over 13% around 2000, staggering. Well, people used to laugh at me. I, I mean, they said exactly, when I go do a, an investment call, they say, Eddie, uh, what am I gonna get from you, 12 or 13%? That's assuming your, your units don't go down. I can make 50% buying, you know, pets.com. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was kind of the, uh, the um, uh, first 10 years. And then the next five years were sort of from 2000 and say two to 2007 or 2008, so five or six years in there was interesting because we had that, uh, uh, REITs actually were coming back in favor with investors, yeah. but we had a whole range of issues. The first was limited liability, so investors got spooked yeah. because trusts didn't have the same limited liability uh, as, as corps, and so the government had to step in and provide limited liability. Meanwhile, a lot of our investors uh, <laughs> exited, and so you had to recover them. And then uh, a couple of years later, we had the taxation issue. Uh, that was probably around 2006, uh, where uh, uh, a lot of businesses tried to convert to a trust format uh, to get a better tax treatment. The Halloween surprise, the October Halloween, 31st, the Halloween 06. Halloween trick or treat, yeah, and that's exactly. When, and uh, so that came out, and uh, that spooked a lot of people until there was clarification that uh, REITs would be uh, exempt from, uh, uh, from the tax changes provided they met certain criteria. Um, but that, again, created some hiccups. But through that period from 2002 to 2008 or so, um, it, was, it was pretty good, but the, you had these handful of issues. And then, of course, we had the financial crash in 2008 and, uh, and everything. Yeah, everything. Uh, but as we recovered over, out of the 2008 period into today, so over the last 10 years, I think that was the starting point for REITs to become more mainstream. And uh, through that period, I mean, there's certainly been some blips from 2009, say, to, to today. Um, but REITs have steadily um, gotten better and better. The industry has gotten stronger. Uh, balance sheets have gotten stronger. And um, uh, so in, in trying to put a pinpoint in it, uh, as Ed said, maybe it's not mainstream yet, but uh, with the... Uh, but it, uh, that was probably the start of where uh, we, we went through a pretty stable period and sort of looked more mainstream. Yeah. And so today we have, you know, at, you know uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, we have uh, 48 REITs in Canada, total market cap of uh, just over $100 billion. Uh, but more importantly, you have entities uh, like RealCan, like Choice, and a number of our competitors that are actually major real estate companies and capable of doing remarkable things in this business, meaning basically either acquire or develop uh, very high quality real estate assets, uh, either mixed use or in each of the sectors we're in. So when you stand back in terms of mainstream, the, these entities basically, the, these are major real estate entities now. Uh, for, for us at Choice, we're 16 billion in assets. 
there's a lot of uh, capability uh, uh, in our organization. So I think as an industry as a whole, it, it's, we are kind of looking We're at mainstream. Main, we, we are may mainstream. Not be there yet a couple of things I just it. add. That I thought, I think you're bang on in everything you said, Steve. Uh, I think it was interesting. I, I know I got a lot of feedback when we came through the 08, 07, 08, 09 financial crisis. And the fact, I think, of all of these sort of REITs of any consequence, there was exactly one uh, that cut its distribution. Um, and that gave people a lot of confidence um, for the poor guy who did. I don't think he's ever recovered from it, but that's another story. Uh, and the second comment I'd like to make is it shows you what kind of world uh, we're working in. If you add together all those market caps of 100 billion, you've almost got one tenth of Amazon's market yeah, exactly. cap. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. Uh, well, yeah, I, as an industry, I live with them every yeah, day. Yeah, as an as an industry, it's still quite small. Yeah. So. so what's next for each of you? I mean, I'll start with that. Actually, what what do you what do you want to accomplish next? What what's your well, path? In the two or three months I got left. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think, uh, you know, personally, I'm really happy uh, with the strategy that uh, we've evolved and the people we have in place to carry it forward, because you're right, you need both. Um, and uh, it's really uh, continuing to redevelop uh, a lot of uh, the assets that we already own. Um, you know, some of that is starting to happen. I think. Uh, at the end of this year, we'll start moving tenants into our first uh, multi-res tower, Young and Eglinton, and over the course of the next two or three years, uh, we'll be completing literally thousands of apartment units, all in big cities, all on transit, and actually quite a few office buildings, usually in partnership with, with others, although we actually own, I don't know, about a million and a half square feet already today that, you know, people... Uh, so that's been good, but it really is completing the, we've got right now, for example, 30 properties where we're either in the rezoning process, have finished the rezoning process, uh, or are getting ready to get into that rezoning process, because it takes, the, the rezoning process in a, in a property in the big cities today, it's two to three years. It's, it's a long process, and it's expensive. So you can't do everything at once. Um, so I just want to see that really get going. I think ultimately everybody of the large REITs is going to be doing that same thing in one way or another. I remember when I started talking about multi-res and on building a modern shopping center sites three, four years ago, uh, I had my, uh, uh, my good friends in the States, because uh, we were partners with Kimco for many mm -hmm. years, say, Eddie, Milton said, Eddie, nobody's going to understand what you're doing. People like pure plays. Multi-res, they're just going to laugh at you. Well, now he's doing multi-res. So, it, I mean, everybody's started to come around that you've got these large land holdings at great uh, intersections. You've got to do something with them than, other than 23% coverage by retail. So I just want to, I think over the next couple of years, more and more will do that, and, and uh, it's going to be fun. But again, with the REIT structure, I made the comment that the REIT structure isn't ideally suited to that. So I think there might be some interesting evolutions of structure. What, do you, what would you like to see change? Um, I actually don't want to see the REIT structure change per se because it does meet um, a huge investor class that, that Stephen has, has properly identified. Uh, retirees, I mean, I look at going to AGM, I, I think there's nothing but white hair out there except for the odd woman. <laughs> but but uh, you know what? It's been a great vehicle. I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me at social events and say, you know, Eddie, you funded my retirement. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it's a great vehicle for people to invest in. So, and, and the safety mechanisms built into it, I think, are equally great. So I, I'm not sure that I would advocate changing any of them. Um, that doesn't mean you can't move things around inside to maybe park things outside that REIT. You know, I, I don't want to get into our whole strategy here, <laughs> but because uh, most of it I haven't told anybody but myself. <laughs> yep. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, you know, but there are, I think things have to evolve because REITs really just aren't set up to do large scale development projects in multitude. They're, they're you know, I, I always say Absolutely. we work through guardrails. 
uh, Adria can. Guardrail number one is our distribution and the sanctity of that distribution and the fact that we need some room between what we're distributing and what we're earning. So you, you know, you, you can't take so many properties all at once out of the income side. Uh, two is leverage, okay? Uh, again, how do you do that? So you, you gotta borrow money to build these things or, or get something. And three is the, the actual percentage limitation on how much your property can be in development. So we work within those three guardrails. I think they're good guardrails, but it may not be for everything we own. That is the best thing. So Stephen, let me ask you first, what's, what's ahead for you? What do you want to accomplish now with, with choice? And is there anything you'd like to change in, about the REIT structure or the REIT industry? In, the, uh, in terms of choice, I mean, we're, in, we're certainly in a different environment now. And I, I think the two main uh, differences are, number one, it's gonna be a slower period of growth. We're in for economic growth. It's gonna be GDP growth will be lower than what we've been used to over the last 25 years. Not every year, but you know, on average. Uh, and secondly, just the rate of change, the pace of change is going to be disruptive. And it's disruptive to a lot of industries, and you can expect it's going to be disruptive to the real estate industry and disruptive to landlords. Um, so against that background, where do we go over the you know, foreseeable future, whether that's 10 years or 25 years? Um, our, our focus is on where do we have a competitive advantage? And um, the, the first place is uh, our land bank. And Ed mentioned this, Rio Can has uh, a very similar thing. Uh, but we, uh, with our uh, merger with Choice, the, uh, we have a lot of sites basically that are grocery anchored sites uh, there, where there is an opportunity to densify or intensify basically, meaning add more footage. And we have enough sites probably to fuel uh, our, our, our capacity to do development probably for 20 years. So it's a huge competitive advantage for us because we don't have to go looking for sites. And a lot of these sites are in markets like the GTA. They're very, very strong sites. And our ability to execute that from a financial um, uh, capital perspective and from a human capital perspective, basically, as Ed mentioned, you're, you're investing in development in an unproductive asset until it starts, uh, until you start to get rent. So you have to measure it. Um, but that is a huge competitive advantage for us because we don't have to go looking for sites. Um, secondly, our relationship with Loblaw. Um, uh, our portfolio, for the most part, is uh, necessity-based uh, retail, so grocery anchored. Uh, we have a lot of shoppers, drug mart. Uh, tenants, the, uh, and that type of retail has been uh, less impacted by disruption and changing retail formats than other types of retail. And having a uh, strategic relationship with Loblaw, uh, who I think basically are one of the leading retailers in Canada and certainly are at the forefront of how uh, grocery retailing and you know, with shoppers, how their retailing is gonna be done over the foreseeable future. And just being part of that as a landlord, I think is a, is a competitive advantage for us. Um, thirdly, critical mass. I mean, we're at a size now, at our, at our current size, where there's a gravitational benefit where we were able to attract, whether it's tenants to our uh, organization, uh, people where you can attract and retain people, your ability to spend money on uh, information technology, and information technology will, be, uh, will make a difference in our business and uh, in, in the real estate business over the, over the next 10 years. And being large and having critical mass uh, uh, allows, us, uh, allows us to do that. So we will focus on, uh, on, uh, on, on our competitive advantages. What do we want to um, accomplish? Uh, we just want to keep getting better. Uh, we, uh, we have a good platform now. Uh, we want to build uh, absolutely a, a, a great real estate entity uh, where uh, we have a portfolio of high quality assets, a uh, first uh, best in class management team. And from an investor perspective, basically, uh, we just uh, we look at it and say, we're best suited for investors who look at this as a long-term uh, long investment. And real estate generally, uh, good quality real estate is, is a long-term investment. So that's where uh, I would okay. like to take it. Well, our monitors up here are telling me that we're getting close to our time, but there are a couple of questions that I want to ask both of you. Um, a little bit off, 
the beaten track of what we've talked about in terms of the history, but both of you have been around the REIT world for a long time. You have, we have lived with the REIT model, the REIT structure, you've lived with governance models that have changed over time. What advice would you give to REIT trustees generally today? I'll start with you, Eddie. <laughs> REIT, REIT trustees? REIT trustees. Don't say, do we have to have a board? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think, look, uh, every, every, it's like a, a REIT, uh, a public one, obviously, because uh, there are private REITs. Um, yeah, public one. A uh, public one, obviously. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of governance. You have to, they have to be involved in a certain mm -hmm. amount of, of uh, uh, risk uh, management. And I think those two things are important, and if done properly by, by a, a REIT board, actually improve the company the REIT. I think what, not just REIT directors, I mean, I'm, I've been on quite a few boards, including the bank board, and there's a real tendency amongst trustees slash directors to go maybe a little too far on governance and uh, risk management and forget about there's an underlying business of which you got capital, but you also got people that are critically important to being able to carry out these strategies, especially in you know the future that I think both Stephen and I share a view of, uh, that the work to be done by REITs to be successful in the future, the way they have been in the past, is much more hands-on, much more technical. You need really uh, qualified senior people uh, to carry that forward. And uh, I think they have to be a little more sensitive to the business strategy and the impact of their decisions and their uh, deliberations on that senior staff. Stephen, what about you? So advice to trustees. Mm -hmm. So um, Jim Torrey, basically, who was the <laughs> founder of your, yes. your law firm, <laughs> and uh, we were lucky enough, and unfortunately Jim passed away yeah. a number of years ago, but we were lucky enough at Crete to have Jim Torrey on our board, and uh, it evolved. He was chairman of our board for a number of years. And um, one, uh, there was uh, a year, uh, it was between Christmas and uh, New Year's, and I was at the office, and Jim called me in the morning, and he said, I, wanna I wanted to speak to you about something, I want to have lunch. So I met him for lunch, and he said, uh, he said, I've been on a lot of uh, public boards, I've been the chair of a lot of public boards, uh, and Jim was well known in Canada, and, yeah, uh, and was on some great boards, great companies, we were lucky to have him on Crete. Um, uh, but he said, I've been on a lot of boards, and he said, I've never been chair, chairman of a board where I got along as well with the CEO as I get along with you. And he said, I've been struggling just over the last day thinking about that. And he said, I want to tell you what I, what I concluded. And he said, I concluded that I get along so well with you because you, you don't keep anything from me. You tell me everything. And uh, so he said, there are no surprises. When we get to a board meeting, I know what's coming. Uh, you're, you're very open with me, very open with the board. And uh, he said, that's why we get along so well. So I said, okay, thank you very much. We left and so on. But I thought about it afterward and the message that wasn't there uh, and that Jim did not articulate was that he made it easy for me to be open with him. And uh -huh. that's a huge uh -huh. thing. Boards don't make it easy uh, for management sometimes to be totally uh, forthright about issues and problems. And you wanna create an environment on your board where management is comfortable uh, talking about anything and everything basically that may be uh, of, of issue to the board. And so in terms of advice to trustees or invites to management people who are, who are uh, on boards re reporting to trustees, uh, try to create an environment basically um, where, where management is comfortable and open and just you know, be careful with the level of criticism and be more open to collaboration and, uh, and hearing what's wrong, uh, so. And one last question. Again, you've both been in the industry for a long time. You're scions of the real estate industry, the REIT industry. There are 48 REITs and probably more coming. Eddie, what advice would you give to young, keen management teams? Um, I think the, the, the key to future research success will be having a strategy that is 
either a little bit different or is very focused and is of interest. I think the days of just saying, here, I've got a portfolio and it's a REIT and it's a decent portfolio and so give me your money, I think are gone. I, I think they actually have to compensate. Here's what I want to accomplish. Here's what I'm doing about it. I'm not saying they have to be focused in one industry or diversified or otherwise, but they have to have a strategy that's going to differentiate them a little bit and give people a reason to invest in them instead of just putting more money in choice or recan. Stephen, the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> not with Ed. He's older. We'll wait for it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Never with Ed. Uh, so uh, I certainly agree. Uh, My, uh, Michael says it's the last word. <laughs> yes, yes. Having a, having, a, having a business model and strategy is critical, but I, I would say my advice to um, would be uh, find a competitive advantage. Find, uh, find something basically that you can do uh, in your REIT, something that you can do better than your peers and build your business for the long term. This is a, is a, is a long term business and uh, focus, don't focus on quarter to quarter, focus on building your business for the long term. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.